Okay, because I can't take the quiet anymore, I'm going to just kick this meeting off today. Um, thank you everyone for joining um, today, uh, today's Catalyst Seminar. And uh, the theme for today's Catalyst Seminar is inequalities um, in young people's mental health um, based on sort of sexual, sexual gender, gender minority status. And um, this topic, I think, is really, really important and very understudied. But the fact that it's understudied is probably may not come as the biggest surprise if we think about the sort of history and sort of advances in sort of both legal, social, and policy um, aspects of gender and sexual minority sort of rights. Um, you know, lots of advancements have only happened in the last two decades. Um, if you think about data, the first time the census in, the, in Britain has collected data on sexual and gender identity is the most recent census last year. So we haven't even had data on um, this aspect of people's lives for all the censuses that have, censuses, a plural of census, that have happened for, you know, centuries. Um, and this is reflected in all sorts of data sources that we collect. So many population-based data sources still do not ask about um, sexual and gender identity. So still a long, long way to go. Um, and even in Britain, so obviously there's massive global inequalities in where um, sort of rights are for sexual and gender minorities. And even in Britain, like as the recent conversion therapy saga shows, you know, we have a long, long way to go. Um, and in many parts of the world, things move forward, but also things move backwards. So for example, very recently, Hungary will back recognition of trans identity. Um, and there's many countries in which sexual minority relations and people are still prosecuted. So, you know, although this is going to be a very interesting seminar, also, um, I suppose the, it's a very sort of serious issue which affects many people. Um, and we're delighted to be able to have the space to talk about this and bring very three very different perspectives to the picture. So the plan was to have three speakers. So we have um, Gemma Lewis, who will bring a sort of more epidemiological perspective, uh, Rebecca Amos, who will present from more young persons, sort of qualitative work she's done with young people, and um, Ian Warwick, who works with professional development of those who work with young people like teachers and um, nurses and things, and has done a lot of work around curriculum development and things in schools. However, unfortunately, Ian is unable to be with us today due to a family health emergency and sends his apologies. So um, we will have uh, two speakers and um, given the time sort of um, rebalancing, the idea is that each speaker will have 20 minutes to present and immediately after their presentation, you can ask questions more directly about what they've presented. So sort of specific questions, if that makes sense for about five minutes. And then we'd like to keep more of the general questions towards the end for a panel discussion around not just what they've presented, but also hopefully more broader discussion around, so what are the evidence gaps, what we can do as a UCL sort of child and adolescent mental health research community to work together to address these gaps and stuff like that. Um, so we'll get started. I will first introduce um, our first speaker today, Dr. Gemma Lewis is a senior research fellow and Henry Dale fellow at the Division of Psychiatry at UCL. Her research focuses on the causes, treatment and prevention of depression and anxiety. She also conducts research on self-harm and suicidality, which commonly co-occur with depression and anxiety. These mental health problems often begin uh, during childhood and adolescence and much of her research focuses on young people. She also uses large population-based cohorts and causal inference methods to inform prevention and analyzes data from large RCTs. So her talk is going to be on an epidemiological perspective of the mental health of sexual minority and trans young people. Gemma, over to you. Okay, thank you, Pravitha. I'll just share my screen. Okay, is that okay? Great, okay, yeah. So I'm gonna talk about the mental health of sexual minority and trans young people, and I'm gonna provide an epidemiological perspective. Uh, Sorry. So I just wanted to um, start with uh, some definitions and some epidemiology. So 
Estimates vary, but around 10% of young people, so approximately around the age of 16 to 17, identify as sexual minorities. And uh, this estimate is based on uh, national representative data from the Millennium Cohort Study and also from the ALSPAC study. So sexual minority here uh, may include young people who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual or queer or are attracted to members of the same gender. Um, I'm going to use the term trans, which I'm going to use as a broad inclusive term for people who are transgender, non-binary or gender diverse. Um, there are uh, one of the points that's going to cut across my talk is that there's far less high quality population based studies of trans young people uh, relative to the quite large amount of research really we have on uh, the sexual orientation of young people when it comes to mental health epidemiology. So. Um, the proportion the proportion of people who, who are trans is relatively unclear, but amongst adults, uh, the proportion of adults who, who are trans is uh, estimated to be around 2%. So I'm going to talk first about some descriptive epidemiology that relates to the mental health of sexual minority young people. So generally just first to comment on something that uh, a general trend that is has been observed over the past few decades amongst amongst young people generally and that is of sort of quite consistent evidence now of, of rising rates of depressive symptoms also of self-harm um, and also there is evidence that the suicide rate has risen generally amongst adolescents in England and Wales. So um, to look at sort of relatively recent data that looks at the distribution of these mental health problems, so depressive symptoms, self-harm and suicide according to sexual orientation, these are data from the uh, age 17 way, the Millennium Cohort Study. And this was at age 17, and at age 17, the uh, Kessler 6 scale was used, which is, uh, often described as capturing psychological distress, but generally thought of as uh, being able to measure symptoms of common mental disorder, including depression and anxiety as well. And what you can see in gold is the distribution of depressive symptoms amongst sexual minority 17 year olds. And in gray, you can see the distribution of depressive symptoms amongst heterosexual 17 year olds. And you can see that uh, the mean depressive symptom score was eight amongst sexual minorities and the mean depressive score was six amongst heterosexuals so evidence of higher levels of depressive symptoms amongst a sexual minority compared with heterosexual young people so the uh, age 16 mcs also looked at uh, this using a binary cutoff so uh, i think a score of 13 on the kessler six scale so uh, here you can see that uh, around uh, around 14% of heterosexuals exceed this uh, cutoff on the Kessler scale. And, you know, these are large differences that, that we're talking about between the heterosexual and the sexual minority population. So around 40% of sexual minority young people exceeded the cutoff for um, high levels of depressive symptoms on this scale. So quite... Uh, quite large differences. So to also look at the similar pattern with self-harm, which we know is frequently comorbid with depressive symptoms. So at age 17, MCS also assessed self-harm using a binary self-harm item, which assessed the prevalence of self-harm over the past 12 months. And here again, you can see that we are dealing with large differences. So over half of LGBTQ young people at age 17 reported having self-harmed in the previous year. And this was compared to also, you know, very high levels in the, in the heterosexual group as well of 21% um, amongst the heterosexuals, but uh, a, large, a large relative difference again between the two groups with sexual minorities being at higher risk of self-harm at age 17. So suicide attempt as well was measured at age 17 in MCS. This was again a uh, binary self-harm question, yes or no, but this time over, over the lifetime. So uh, any form of self-harm with suicidal intent 
intend to doing the life course. And among LGBTQ young people, 22% had reported having attempted suicide at, at some point in their lives, compared to 6% of heterosexuals. So again, uh, high rates in the youth population generally, but large relative differences between the sexual minority and the heterosexual groups. So one of the things that we have done is try to build on these cross-sectional observations by using longitudinal data to examine the time point at which this disparity may emerge and how it might unfold over adolescence. So this was a study that we did in the ALSPAC data set or the Children of the 90s data set. And on the x-axis, we've got the age of young people in the cohort ranging from 10 to 21. And on the y-axis, we've got the uh, average depressive symptom score on the short mood and feelings questionnaire. I've highlighted age 16 in gold here because this was when sexual orientation was measured. So sexual orientation was measured at age 16 and we created two groups. So sexual minority young people and also heterosexual young people. And what you can see is that if we look backwards at the history of depressive symptoms, then there was a small difference that emerged between these two groups as early as uh, 10, to 11, 10 to 11 years of age. That difference then becomes bigger as adolescence progresses and it's largest around the age of 16, which perhaps makes sense because that was when sexual orientation is, is measured, but the difference persists up to age 21. And then we know that the difference between sexual minorities and heterosexuals in terms of uh, descriptive epidemiology is also present in, in adults and also in older adults as well. So I wanted to um, sort of just reflect on on why this trajectory of depressive symptoms may occur and why these differences you know, appear to emerge fairly early in adolescence. So the pattern that we found in the ALSPAC data has also been found in, in a Dutch cohort called TRAILS and also been reported in, in an American cohort. So it is a pattern that has been observed in other data sets. This here is a longitudinal study which, uses, which used American data and used a similar design, but to look at bullying rather than mental health outcomes. So sexual orientation was again assessed at age 16 or 10th grade in America. And then exposure to bullying was assessed at age 11 in fifth grade and also in seventh grade and also again at 16 in 10th grade. And what you can see is that the young people who identified as sexual minorities at age 16 had a, a higher prevalence of bullying, even at age 11. So even at age 11, 13% uh, of the sexual minority group were exposed to bullying compared to 8% of the heterosexual group. So exposure to risk factors that are related to depression seems to occur uh, early on in adolescence as well. So I wanted to point out, I would just point to this slide here, which is, was a study conducted by Rebecca Amos and also by Pravitha, who are both here, just to indicate that the causes of, you know, the, these, uh, this mental health disparity is, you know, highly likely to be broader than just bullying. So in this, uh, this is a cross-sectional snapshot of the Millennium Cohort Study at age 14 and uh, a sexual minority group compared to a heterosexual group. And I just wanted to draw attention to um, family problems. So in this gold box here, these uh, this corresponds to uh, the blue data here. So actually sexual minorities were um, sort of uh, no different to heterosexuals in terms of friends, but family problems were much more prevalent. So. Um, not close to mother, not close to father, arguing, sibling bullying, and then other forms of bullying, and also uh, verbal assault, physical assault, sexual assaults, and attacks as well, being more common in the sexual minority group than the heterosexual group, again, from, from a young age. So, um, as I mentioned, there has been far less high-quality population-based work on trans young people and this is a gap that needs to be addressed. So 
but I just wanted to point out some descriptive epidemiology from, you know, the, um, the population-based work that has been done. So this is some data from the 2017 Youth Risk Behaviour Survey in the States, which looked at over 17,800 students in, uh, in 2017 with an average age of 15. Uh, the 1.3% uh, were transgender, 1.4% uh, gender questioning, and then 97% cisgender. And what you can see here is that compared to the cisgender group, uh, transgender young people were uh, three times uh, more likely to be experiencing self-harm and also the gender questioning group. And uh, this year is the data for suicide attempt. So compared to the cisgender group, the transgender young people were six times more likely to have attempted suicide and the gender questioning group were three times more likely to have attempted suicide. Sorry, that was suicidal ideation and suicide attempt. So uh, this is a, another study. So um, which so this this focused on on young transgender women in um, a diverse uh, multi multi city cohort again in the again in the states. So the vast majority of work on trans mental health has been done in the states with a a huge lack of research from other countries. But um, no cis no cisgender comparison group here, but um, a high prevalence of mental health problems. So uh, major depressive disorder lifetime was 35% and, and current depressive disorder was 14% and then suicidality 18% and generalized anxiety 8%, PTSD 8% and alcohol dependence 11%. So in terms of why, Minority stress theory, which was originally proposed in relation to sexual orientation, but has been uh, extended to uh, gender identity as well, uh, you know, outlines the uh, exp you know, experiences of homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, and of course, uh, bullying, stigma, prejudice, and discrimination. There's the issue of exposure to microaggressions as well, which can be defined as everyday statements which are hurtful and also an environment which doesn't doesn't you know doesn't on average tend to promote or prioritize inclusivity positivity and acceptance of diverse uh, sexual sexual and gender identities so sort of heteronormative and cisnormative are terms that are often used to to refer to this to the environment which which doesn't promote doesn't promote diversity in this realm I just wanted to point out a study that is currently being conducted by a PhD researcher uh, called Talon Wright, who works with myself and Alexandra Pittman at the UCL Division of Psychiatry. And uh, Talon is recruiting a cross-sectional sample of trans, non-binary and gender diverse adults that are 18 years or older to specifically investigate this hypothesis about the association between microaggressions and um, mental health problems amongst the uh, trans population. So I wanted to talk a little bit about prevention because, you know, generally uh, within the epidemiology of, of mental health, prevention and, and, you know, primary prevention in particular is something that, that needs, needs more work. So uh, following up on these findings that that we had in, in ALSPAC and also in, you know, the findings in other cohorts. We did some lived experience work with um, sexual minority and trans young people from the McPin Foundation to sort of uh, figure out how best to prevent the early emergence of these mental health problems. And these young people um, told us that, you know, they, they, they spoke a lot about the family environment, but they spoke, they spoke perhaps more so about school. So as most young Young people attend school that's obviously a good place to start for prevention and that's something you know generally that is being investigated and, and spoken about a lot at the moment but inclusive and accepting school environments would help to reduce anxiety depression and other mental health problems in sexual minority and trans young people and interventions uh, should be universal meaning they should include heterosexual and cisgender students as well as teachers and 
in this lived experience group, young people were really, really keen on the idea of universal school based interventions because, you know, they uh, were really keen on the fact that universal interventions don't single any young people out. They are aimed at the whole population and, you know, nobody has to be selected based on certain personal characteristics or mental health characteristics. And we also know from uh, physical health research that universal interventions are perhaps sort of, you know, the, the potentially the most effective approach that we have to the primary prevention of uh, common health problems. So I just wanted to talk briefly about a project that we uh, have almost completed, which was an active uh, part of the active ingredients uh, welcome trust um, commissioned piece of work. So the uh, this this uh, scheme was was focused on active ingredients, which um, may be important in reducing, preventing, or treating youth depression and anxiety. So the active ingredient that we investigated, you know, based on the research that that I've just shown you was promoting inclusivity and acceptance of diverse sexual and gender identities in universal school-based interventions. And this was uh, you know, derived by working closely with the lived experience group at McPin as well and the, um, the sort of hypotheses and ideas that they had about what would be feasible and effective. So we conducted a rapid realist review of what interventions are out there and what may work for who, and why in what contexts and we are aiming to produce an intervention toolkit that could could be used by schools. I just wanted to sort of summarize the findings uh, using this infographic which was produced for us by the McPin Foundation. So our review identified four different classes of interventions that that exist. So the first one was Gay Straits Alliance Clubs and Pride Clubs, which aim to provide young people with safe spaces where they can normalize their thoughts and feelings. And um, these have the potential to lead to reductions in bullying, discrimination, and suicidal thoughts and attempts. However, one thing that emerged is that it's important that these clubs have wider acceptance throughout the school environment so that young people aren't sort of singled out and bullied for attending them. So the wider school environment, and you know, the wider school climate really emerged as, as really, really important. And one of the ways that the school environment can perhaps be improved is through LGBTQ plus inclusive anti-bullying and harassment policies. And we found evidence that general anti-bullying policies were less effective at reducing bullying based on sexual or gender identity than LGBTQ plus inclusive policies. So that aspect was uh, thought to be very important. Another way to address and improve the wider school climate and environment is through LGBTQ plus inclusive curriculums. So, and this one was really, really sweet. As part of the review, we worked with our lived experience advisory group. And, you know, this one here was really, really important to young people. So normalizing being LGBTQ and advocating, you know, equality and inclusion and providing visibility and role models. And, you know, this can lead to greater empathy and support from uh, heterosexual and cisgender students and teachers and increase inclusivity and acceptance and potentially uh, reduce bullying. And we also came across a lot of sort of um, single event workshops and media based interventions. So things like uh, panels um, and presentations and photo exhibitions and, and things like that that are aimed at increasing inclusivity, acceptance and raising awareness. And these are thought to, to lead to increased understanding and empathy um, from heterosexual and, and cisgender people in order to promote inclusivity and acceptance. So um, yeah, that's, that, that, that is it. Thank you. Thanks, Gemma. Um, so we have five minutes for questions. Um, but if you can keep the questions like directly about what Gemma has presented or sort of clarification questions and sort of keep the more general discussion questions for after both speakers have presented, please, that would be really good. And but you're welcome to just sort of either raise hand or unmute and ask a question. But if you prefer to, you're also welcome to type out the question and I will, um, I will read them out. 
Um, I'd like to give people one minute to decide if they have questions or not. And if not, we will move on to our next speaker. Lynn? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Gemma. I'm on, I wanted to ask how good is the evidence for those interventions you talked about, really? And you know, is it something that we ought to be doing now, or is it more, you know, sort of more preliminary than that? <clears throat> yeah, thank you. That's a really good question. It's something I didn't touch upon there in that last bit of the talk. So, the um, type of review that we did is is, a, is called a rapid realist review, and I hadn't done one before, but basically the, the, the method is about, um, it's, it's sort of based on the assumption that we need to do more than investigate the effectiveness of interventions using trials. So it's basically about generating hypotheses and building something called a program theory, which is based on a, a context, a mechanism and an outcome. So which interventions are more likely to work better for which groups or not and one of the sort of prerequisites of this method is that you don't conduct a quality assessment which is something that you know uh, we we debated but decided we would to do in order to be uh, true to this method didn't do a quality assessment we built a theory which is why i was sort of presenting it as this type of intervention exists it might work better for these groups in these environments so the clubs might work in an environment where the, the, the climate has already been sort of uh, changed to be more positive. But basically, the conclusion is that the evidence in favour of these interventions is not strong at all. Um, you know, a lot of it, many, you know, I don't think we came across one trial, actually. So, you know, one thing that stems from this is that, you know, you could develop a a really nice whole school intervention which could be um tested in a in a, a cluster randomized control trial so that would be a, an important next stage thank you brilliant thanks Lynn. um okay um, so i think we can keep uh, any remaining questions for the discussion afterwards and i'd like to introduce our second speaker um, Rebecca Amos is a postdoctoral research fellow across the University of Bangor, Public Health Wales, and the World Health Organization Collaborating Center of Investment for Health and Wellbeing. Her research interests include identifying predictors of wellbeing and psychopathology in young people, exploring areas of and reasons for disparity and adversity, and taking a public health approach to facilitating and improving young people's um, lifelong mental health outcomes. During her PhD, she investigated the predictors of well-being and psychopathology in sexual minority adolescents in the UK using epidemiological, experimental, and qualitative approaches. And this is some of the work she will present today. Um, over to Rebecca. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to start sharing the screen now. Um, and it's a pleasure to talk to you about this research. So um, this is, uh, could you see it? Oh, there we go. So this is the final chapter of my PhD. Um, this kind of speaks to the more theoretical and in-depth side of what we've been looking at. So focusing on UK adolescents, um, particularly sexual minorities. So I'm going to present to you a constructivist grounded theory um, and how sexual minorities have navigated their identity, well-being, and mental health. Um, so just a snapshot of previous work that we've done. Um, this is earlier in my PhD when we're thinking about, well, we need a picture of what sexual minorities are going through and we need a contemporary picture. And as Gemma um, alluded to, the, there are broad things happening in sexual minority people. Um, so we had a look at mental health, interpersonal difficulties, antisocial behaviours and health related behaviours in this population. And um, we use populational um, based data. So with the Millennium cohort, so a nice rigorous data set to use. Um, and our findings were quite stark in terms of mental health. So if you have a look at this infographic, um, you can see for all of um, our kind of outcomes, depressive symptoms, self-harm and low life satisfaction, they were elevated quite substantially. Um, and this was significant when we uh, ran the odd ratios as well. Um, also interpersonal difficulties are heightened as well as health related behaviors. Uh, we didn't see that affected antisocial behaviors, which is probably quite comforting. Um, but all of the other kind of um, outcomes that we see, we know that we'll probably have um, an, a poor outcomes in later life. 
So our question was why, and I know that Gemma's alluded to this as well, why are we seeing such a pattern? Um, and previous researchers, uh, the minority stress theory is, um, is, is getting old now. And, and as Gemma said as well, uh, people have adapted it. So what the best kind of approach that we had was a qualitative one to really give voice to the social minor, uh, sexual minorities um, and potential injustices that they face. So our research question was, how do sexual minority youth navigate their emerging identities and the potential conflicts that this produces? So there's some assumption there that there's a conflict, at least somewhere, which um, is, is contributing to a mental health difficulty in particular, um, and it's inherently developmental. Um, so just to go over why constructivist grounded theory, I know some people have more quantitative um, knowledge in the chat, um, why do this and not a classical grounded theory? So I'll explain a little bit about the epistemology, but I'll try to be brief. So with the constructivist grounded theory, which was developed by Sharmaz, it recognizes that there's an a priori influence. Um, whereas classical grounded theory, it's, it's supposed to be very nuanced. Um, no research exists uh, at all, uh, but that is quite unrealistic in the current age that we live in. So we can still add and adapt um, and extend current theory using the constructivist gravity theory um, and explore the parameters of experience. So again, as uh, Gem has alluded to as well, there's not so much work in the UK for this population and the qualitative work does tend to be focused on particular issues, so psychopathologies um, or suicidal ideation, health harming behaviours and mainly in adults. So again, the, the benefit of a grounded theory is that we can focus on the individual, focus on psychological structures that might be impacting them and the way they make sense of uh, their social world, but also how these social structures um, and potential inequalities are perpetuating potential effects. So we can have this grounded theory being a way to do social justice by highlighting these disparities we can then intervene and change uh, structures that aren't uh, working for young people. Um, and it was really important to be theory challenging at this point. So as I've mentioned before, the minority stress theory by Mayer is, I think it was developed in 2003. People have since um, adapted that or made some amendments to it. And it tends to be used um, in the older version constantly in the literature. Um, and, it, and a lot of sexual minority research has been criticised for being heavily focused on psychopathology um, and victim-led narratives. And this is something that has come out of the PhD uh, as well. So to extend current theory, we, we also wanted to form one that it could, you know, be exactly like the minority stress theory. That's unlikely, um, but it wouldn't be limited by that. And again, it'd be informed by uh, UK culture, uh, contemporary adolescent um, viewpoints. So again, extending work that's been done. So again, just to quickly give you a brief snapshot of what a grounded theory is, a constructivist one. Um, the epistemology requires that you cast doubt on particular themes. Doubt is essential to come into a realization of um, what a particular category might be, in what instance that seems to be true, um, and for who. Uh, so how can I cast doubt on a particular emerging theme? So if, if a, a lot of sexual minorities say that they experience violence, maybe that's because they live in a particular area and now I should recruit people from a different area, for example. Um, truth is conditional, so it's not a positivist approach. We don't, we're not trying to assess an objective truth, just how truth is constructed by the individual and how that, that perceived truth impacts them. And to do so, we need to have multiple perspectives. Whereas in some qualitative research, you may just have um, a homogenous sample. We want to cast out on particular themes. We want to develop a more rigorous theory that has transferability to other research. Um, so we can't generalize in qualitative research, but if we assess the parameters of what seems to be true for a population, it can transfer into other domains. Um, and another part of this is methodological self-consciousness. So to assess my bias as a researcher, but also as the institution, uh, the place that I'm from, the culture that I've grown up in, and how that impacts the way that I conduct research and understand my participants. So, for example, being a sexual minority individual, that may impact how I interact and conduct my research. 
So a brief snapshot of how the analysis actually was conducted. Um, people were interviewed and I analysed each case separately. And that happened alongside recruitment. So that can inform the semi-structured interview. Do we need to change questions? And do we need to select a different type of participant characteristic? Um, after doing that, you develop a theory per person. Uh, we select categories, so categories being a theme that is more typically used in other researchers as uh, the word to use. Um, then we do a cross-case analysis, which is with everybody and seeing the similarities, the intersections between themes, uh, the differences, so where things aren't true for a particular participant. Um, and so the theoretical element really is iterative and uh, constant comparative method. So on the left-hand side here, this is just a brief snapshot of the sample. And as I said, it was a theoretical sample. Uh, we knew that sexual minorities might differ based on their orientation. So people being queer, bisexual, gay, uh, pansexual. So bisexual people might be exposed to different um, types of victimization than a gay person. And there might be different protective factors. Um, we also wanted variation in age um, and gender. So as particularly for gender, um, that was something that came out. If you have a look at the uh, table on the left-hand side, early on, we were getting a lot of female um, participants and it was quite hard to recruit males. So we had to quite purposefully select that. Um, a lot of people white British at the beginning as well. So we had to purposely try to vary ethnicity and, and see, well, does this change based on ethnicity and what are the additional, um, what, what does that have any additional impact? So, this is, a, this is going to be fairly complicated to explain, but I hope you bear with me. And if you do have questions, just ask towards the end. Um, but as the theory emerged, there was a, a definite hierarchy in the construction of experience um, and, and how it impacted sexual minority youth. So it's a three-tiered hierarchy um, with two poles. So uh, the, the first poll I will explain in a moment is about uh, the promotion of heteronormativity, so the culture of promoting heteronormativity. And the second poll, or the second culture, is uh, the queer space and, and how queerness is enacted and the, the rules around that membership. So the, the hierarchy goes culture, um, what the laws and rules are around that culture, how it's enacted, and then the impact it has on that, uh, that young person. So these two poles are antagonistic, but they're interconnected, so they influence one another. Um, and it's important to bear in mind that this is a developmental theory in essence, because we've followed, we've done retrospective interviews of how um, people navigated adolescence. So it's non-linear, but it has temporal and developmental components. So whereas some people might be further ahead in their journey, other people might, have be, might be a bit behind. where there might be progress in one domain, there might be regression in another. So this is how it looks. Um, so on either side, these are the poles, um, the top one being the culture of promoting heteronormativity and gender binarism. And I'll explain why I've chosen to um, have gender binarism interlinked with heteronormativity in a moment. Um, and then at the bottom, we have uh, queerness or the queer space and culture. Um, and that has a dashed line around it because uh, what I found from participant interviews is the queer space is ever expanding. So if you think about um, the LGBT acronym, that's changed over the past 10 years to include uh, queer people, intersex and asexual people. Um, whereas the culture of heteronormativity is a lot more uh, rigid and um, not, not dynamic. Um, from that, we found that um, heteronormativity is promoted via suppression. Uh, that can be in institutions, it can be via religion, it can be in the family home. Um, it's also enacted via overt hostility. That tells the person that being a sexual minority is not acceptable and uh, or that you do not no longer fit this group membership. And then othering, which also is um, a way of, of, of in ke keeping in people who belong to a particular group where they're supposed to be and excluding them. So if we suppress sexual minority education, if people don't know how to be queer, um, then there becomes an issue of, well, you've, you're pushed out of a heteronormative space, but how do I then access that queer space? So there is this element developmentally where people are kind of in limbo. Um, and looking at the queerness um, culture, 
that's an active via representation. So how gay people um, conduct themselves. Uh, so for example, at Pride, it could be online. A lot of people found that online. Um, but it, it doesn't always have to be positive. It can be negative as well. And that can put people back into a shell of concealing them, their identity. Connectivity was really important. So this kind of um, natural kinship that people seem to find with one another. Um, it was an unspoken rule that sexual minorities seem to connect. Um, and also that helped them discover how to be gay again. And I'll explain later on in, in the questions if anyone wants to ask why I say that. Um, and then othering also happened. So I think this is really important to highlight that just because this culture might fit their identity more doesn't mean it's all um, you know, sunshine and rainbows and everything, that there are difficulties there too. So I'll just kind of highlight this with a few quotes. Okay, so here is Jack, um, and Jack talks about, and this really speaks to the gender binarism in the heteronormative culture. So why should I, um, why shouldn't I be like everyone else? I should be playing football with the lads. I should have a girlfriend and that kind of thing. So kind of highlighting, well, being a sexual minor, but being a heterosexual person is associated with all kinds of other things. So you should act this way. You should um, play football. You should like stereotypical male things and uh, men and women conduct themselves differently. Um, and this is another way uh, heteronormativity was en enacted with the suppression element. By not being talked about at school, it just makes it feel like something that's really abnormal. Um, and this was a major piece that came out of this work that every participant pretty much talked about school being uh, school education as not really um, including same sex relationships or multiple gender relationships. And therefore, they have to educate themselves in a different way. So by suppressing that education, you're pushing somewhere someone into a queer space and that representation that may be good, but may not be. Um, and then this is over hostility. So Jasper says, um, I've had the F slur used at me quite a few times. Um, I've heard it in conversation, not to stereotype, but it's normally white straight men. Again, thinking about, uh, you know, queer people become uh, hyper vigilant to who might be uh, enforcing that heteronormativity. And we see again that, you know, well, why might a, a white straight man want to enact that? So they stay in that membership of that um, heteronormative and gender binary space. Um, and this participant, Rosie, talks about how othering works to separate this, th these groups from one another. So, and, and how she didn't really like labels either. So if you've got them all as one group, then you can be like, we are the dominant and privileged and you're marginalized and oppressed. It gives people that binary to kind of use and then oppress people. So the, the kind of essence that might be coming out here is this binary or this segregation of groups really isn't helpful, but it's not as simple as one side wins over the other, one side's beneficial over the other either. Um, and then just talking about what the kind of queer space feels like to some people, Josh says, you'll see a whole no new community effectively, a whole new world. Um, the LGBT experience is like a world unto itself. Um, and this, this Josh was really insightful as a participant, and this was a point where my analysis led me to see that these cultures, um, these two poles are kind of antagonistic. And it's not to say that sometimes being pushed in a queer space is a bad thing. Over time, there can be serious advantages to it. The fact that you don't have to conform to a gender expression, the fact you don't have to have stereotypical relationships that are monogamous, um, you don't have those existing narratives. Um, and it can be quite fun. So it's not necessarily to say that it's all um, terrible. And that's kind of the point of this work that we, we're trying to represent the holistic experience. Um, and then Gray here talks about, well, difficulties in the queer community itself. So it can be quite toxic, um, having to live up to certain standards that are positional, like having to be hyper-masculine. So even though typically in queer space, um, gender expression, different types of relationships are really accepted and it's really like a diverse group. Um, there is some standards with gay men being more attractive if they're hyper-masculine. So it's this duality, it's this kind of, this can cause conflict in both ways um, and therefore, you know, have an impact on the sexual minority person. Uh, and then Jasmine talks about how she has lots of different friends and how they gravitate quite naturally towards each other. 
and again about how much diversity they have. So this kind of um, experience of being excluded and then included in a different group with all these diverse people and uh, kind of nuanced places to um, find, find oneself that led to this kind of commitment to supporting others and that was really strong um, and it was I think quite nice finding. Okay so I'm not sure how we're doing for time but just bear with me. So we're looking at um, now the impact this all has on the person so concealing one's identity and this did tend to be associated with the heteronormative culture and its enactment so via suppression you know it's something not to talk about if you've been if someone's been hostile to you you don't you don't want to happen again however it can happen in the queer space as well by by thinking okay i need to know how to be queer i need to know um what what you know is there anyone like me you can see some horror stories which is what people said um and v hand speaks here i could never speak to someone i kept on bottling up and thinking it's a problem. And Vihan was one of those people that was on the older side, yet still very much concealed their identity um, and limited access to the queer space, which would have been beneficial for them. Um, Silver here talks about um, being worried about female students thinking um, that they're a predator, um, that they were looking at them. And so again, that's, um, that's led them to conceal their identity um internalized homonegativity as well which i think was more associated with heteronormativity and gender binarism uh so rosie says here it's easy for people to have um this internalized homophobia because you're essentially constantly being told that heterosexual is how you should be so the, the this is a this is very much a feeling it's it, it doesn't always have to be somebody saying specifically that you are wrong it's this culture that's really pernicious uh, so it can be quite uh, covert. Um, so commitment to supporting others, which I think was a really positive thing that came out of this. Um, so Josh speaks here, I have this sort of strong desire to give back to the LGBT community and help other people, because I feel to not do so would be some sort of dereliction of duty. Um, and again, you know, interact with the diverse people, um, going through adversities yourself, you want to support others. Um, and there was a very so strong social justice element to that. Um, and there's also resilience and confidence that comes out of being a sexual minority. So I said before, you know, you have this initial, uh, you know, difficulty accessing a new space that that almost seems um, invisible and is fraught with differences and, and all types of different people and not knowing your niche. But over time, it can come to a bring you to a place of confidence and seeing really that this binary is, is quite um, not very useful. So Meredith says here, if you're a sexual minority, it can make you more confident um, because she goes from being secretive about it to being really open about it. And I think th that some sexual minorities uh, expressed as well that, you know, they would rather be a sexual minority than heterosexual. So, um, you know, you can cry and if you're a male, a gay male, you can cry and no one judges you because they see you as gay and you're allowed to break that gender. Um, expression anyway um, and then jack speaks here about overcoming a lot of things and basically getting his life together so knowing that he's had barriers but he you know he's come out the other side so there is that resilience and that ability to overcome adversity um okay so just to wrap up what do i think this adds in addition to the theories that already exist so it provides a developmental roadmap, I believe, and this will be something that'll be a lot easier to see when it's written up. Um, I've given you a brief snapshot today, but there are particular intervention points, um, you know, schools, and this is what Gemma said, it just, it came out so strongly that there needs to be this inclusive curriculum um, just to talk about, and the fact that teachers talk about in an educational way sometimes isn't good enough either. Um, I think it needs to be a casual conversation needs to be allowed as well. Um, so it can we can have this developmental roadmap, but also if people are lagging on the, on the journey of discovering or assimilating or accessing queer space or um, are still very much concealing their identity, we can we can intervene and therapists might be able to as well. So that's something um, I'll work on writing up. There's difficulties on both sides, and I think that's really not represented in the literature. Um, that you know some of the heterosexual ideals of 
okay men are attractive when they're really like muscly they they've gone into uh the gay area as well so it's not all just it it makes it even more difficult um so there are positive and negative factors you, you are more resilient you might have more commitment to social justice you can have less traditional relationships which is quite freeing um but it, we can't deny the negative impact that it has on people psychologically and you can see why as a young person it could be so confusing and really impact you at younger ages um and i think that I, I think i've not really seen in the literature either is this this idea of suppression and invisibility i think it's because it's something we can't touch it's an omission of something but that real lack of representation or um suppression of talk about in the family um not growing up with it you know people recognize really early on that they were different and it's kind of like they felt their voices were suppressed and at school um just a real strong lack of education around that um so again yeah, it brings me to education i think that was the major thing we found that um this really needs to um come from schools seeing as everyone's has to go to school um and you have interaction with peers but also your teachers so i think that's it for me um I assume people have questions and there's my email address if you should want any resources or to ask anything so stop sharing. Thanks Rebecca. Also uh, both of your themes would have led so nicely into what Ian was going to talk about which was like inclusive curriculum design and trying to make uh, and school based stuff um, but unfortunately we will not hear that presentation today but I think it would have led on really nicely from both of your talks. Um, okay, any questions specifically for uh, Rebecca based on her presentation? Um, if people could either raise hands or put it in the chat. Um, if not, we can move to the sort of more general discussion. Um, while, so for the general discussion, again, you're welcome to sort of ask questions sort of by raising your hand, but if you'd rather not sort of come onto camera and ask the question, you're also really welcome to just type it in and I can um, ask the questions to the panel. But uh, just to kick us off, I um, really like both of your views on or thoughts on sort of evidence gaps that you see that we can work with, like really need to fill and things you can do more interdisciplinary. I mean, both of you are quite interdisciplinary yourself, so you present and presented, you know, both qualitative and quantitative work. Um, but just yes, yeah, some thoughts on where you see the big gaps are that need filling next would be helpful to hear your thoughts on. Is that in an interdisciplinary way in particular? No, it could be just evidence gaps that you think that you really think are the next thing gaps that need filling and serious attention from the research community. I think the instant uh, one that comes to mind is just the global issue that these identities are not OK in a lot of countries. Um, and what can we do to, to change that? I mean, this really is a piece of social justice as well. I think we can't shy away from it, um, you know, to, to, to highlight these difficulties that people are going through. So how can we globally work with people to start changing the narrative? What's going to work? you know, what cultural understandings do they have? How can we not, you know, um, try to put our opinion on people, but like start a narrative that works? So that's quite an ambitious thing, but that's really a major problem. Yeah, good point. Gemma? Yeah, I think from a, a quantitative epidemiological perspective, we definitely, um, yeah, as I said, need, need more high quality population-based research on, uh, trans mental health compared, you know, uh, need large population based studies compared, you know, that compared to a cisgender comparison group. You know, I mentioned that all of the work, a lot of the work so far on trans mental health has been done in the States. And, you know, that leads to, you know, Becky's point about um, needing more research from other countries, from, uh, from low and income, uh, low and middle income countries in particular. I also uh, wanted to comment on was one of uh, quotes on on Becky's slide about you know the binary, and you know something that we often talk about, isn't it? Is the diversity of groups isn't reflected 
in quantitative studies in particular. So we often create this sexual minority group or a trans group, and we often don't have the numbers to break down within that group. You know, there's some evidence that bisexual women have worse mental health problems than other sexual minority groups, for example. So I think exploring that diversity in more detail in quantitative studies is probably uh, would probably be helpful. And I think, you know, related to Lynn's question, improving the quality of evidence on interventions, you know, I think schools and public health practitioners would really benefit if there was stronger evidence on, on what works in schools. Thanks both. Uh, we have a really nice question from Jonathan around being an early career researcher. Um, and um, he says he's just starting his PhD, uh, looking at the effect of the pandemic on the mental health of LGBTQ plus youth, and was wondering what advice you have for a beginner researcher working with this community. Do you mind if I go? Please do. Okay. Um, I think just get involved early and um, think about what you can do for them as well so how are you going to be able to support them are you going to transfer the research with them um you know is there anything you can help with and, and just be personable but I think get started early with groups um it's crazy how much online things are now so I'm just going to say it reddit is really useful facebook's really useful um think about having a group you know that intersectional lens that you don't want to just have a load of white cisgender uh, sexual minorities that are really highly educated which is so, super easy to do um if you're just recruiting from your uh, university lgbt groups reach out um and just keep trying it, it can be hard and good luck Gemma, do you have anything to add to that point around advice for early career researchers in this area not no i don't i think that was a really good answer from from rebecca's best much better positions to answer than me from my perspective you know working with um young people with lived experience has uh, been really, really helpful in shaping my uh yeah hypotheses and stuff so that's another thing to mention okay uh, we have a question around um neurodiversity um so uh, dorota asked a question around people who um, are more gender and um, so are neurodiverse also are much more likely to be um, sexual and gender diverse. And is that something you have looked at in relation to the research, like sort of how neurodevelopmental um, sort of a neurodivergence um, and rates of mental health are related to those in sexual minorities and gender minorities? I don't mind uh, going first with this. This is something that I started to get a bit more interested in, in like a very gentle way. Um, I haven't seen a lot of research on this and I don't know how established it is, but anecdotally it does seem to be the case. I, I couldn't speak to, I'm not a professional in neurodivergent populations, but um, I think more will come out about that. I don't know why they would correlate, but um, could be all sorts of reasons so i think that's that's definitely a piece of work that can be done that can be done Brilliant. thanks becky um Gemma, there's a question here for you specifically from laura nixon that asks what would you say to groups that suggest that lgbtq plus orientations are a result of mental health difficulties and not the other way around yeah i think that um you know it's a very dis discriminatory point yeah. Um, and I think, you know, it's, uh, um, you know, if you look at the, you know, trajectories of mental health problems that we saw in the ALSPAC mm -hmm. cohort, you know, um, the uh, uh, mental health problems emerge uh, early in this group, you know, largely due to uh, all of the other evidence that, that we presented, which is due to, you know, sort of bullying and, you know, high levels of exposure to stigma, discrimination, you know, all of the theoretical basis is about exposure to discrimination, prejudice, heteronormative and cisnormative um, uh, environment. So, yeah, there's not a sort of, you know, important place for that question within, within my research, but, you know, it, it, it does come up from, from, from certain groups and 
you know, it does often require uh, a response, a strong response. I don't know if you have any responses to that, Rebecca. Um, I think sometimes um, scientific and social things get confused and I, I don't know, I, I just don't, <laughs> as a sexual minority, I'm completely biased. I'm like, never ask that question. Um, but yeah, I, I, I just agree with what you said, Gemma. You know, we've got the evidence there. I think a lot of sexual minority research, especially in the early days, was proving that sexual minority people aren't deviants and um, aren't uh, acting, you know, terrible parents. So there's loads of literature about that. Um, and I think that narrative fed into some of that um, by proving it kind of fed into it as maybe it is a problem. Um, but now we're more focused on like, how can we reduce these inequalities? Because they exist and it's quite obvious. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I didn't think so, Laura. But yeah, you, you know, you want to have good, you want to have a good clap back, don't you? Yeah, I get you. Yeah. Um, I think Kenneth asked us a question. Oh yes, there's a question around how you interpret your research in terms of gender development in developmental psychology. Anything specifically around sort of different developmental stages, so for example, early adolescents versus young adults? I don't mind saying something on this. Yeah, go ahead. Um, particularly with the, the grounded theory that I just presented, there was, there was a strong developmental aspect to it. The fact that people already knew at young ages that they were attracted to the same gender or multiple genders um, and, and kind of less aware of the social um, impact of that. That it was just a thing. I'm just a young kid who likes that teacher and that teacher. Um, and then that becoming more obvious that it wasn't okay. I think as well, just thinking about being an adolescent and what we're seeing with adolescent mental health getting worse, um, the, the, all these additional demands on young people, exposure to online um, influence and um, the extension of adolescence as, a, as an age, it, it already is a lot for them to deal with. So this additional pressure I think is significant. Um, and that's really what my PhD focuses on. So I'll look out for that when it's finished. I think, um, yeah, the sort of the intersection between sexual orientation and gender is, you know, uh, relevant for some people. And in Alsbach, I think there's been a study which looked at some interesting data early in life on parent rated gender non-conformity and uh, you know th those measures are available in ALSPAC and I think some people have looked at you know the association between early life gender non-conformity and how that relates to later sexual orientation and also later mental health and found that you know there is a sort of small correlation between gender non-conformity and and sexual orientation so I think you know yeah the intersection that exists for some people is 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 important and relevant. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from um, Alvin around the changing effects of culture and how this can be accounted for in epidemiological work in this area. Yeah, thanks. I'll, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So um, we did a piece of work recently with um, uh, Alexandra, Alexandra Pittman, Louise Marston and Michael King, where we looked, compared um, sort of descriptive mental health problems in two adult psychiatric morbidity surveys. So one that was conducted um, in the early 2000s and one that was conducted in 2014. Now I don't know that, you know, I'm not that don't know that spans a particularly, you know, interesting or change, you know, changing time in in attitudes, but we wanted to investigate whether the disparity in mental health had changed at all. And unfortunately we didn't find any evidence that it had. Um, but again, you know, maybe it span quite the right time periods when attitudes have changed. But I think, you know, as you were pointing out, cultural attitudes are sort of always changing. There's some interesting work in the States which has looked at, you know, after a policy change, uh, state level, the effect that can have on mental health and, you know, positive policies related to marriage can have, have, have been shown to have 
positive effects on on mental health. So I think that's the way to look at this, and also perhaps you know uh, cross cultural comparisons between countries that have different attitudes. I'm not, I don't know that literature very well, and I don't think there's an awful lot of it, but that would be something else to look at to sort of tap into that question. I think. Um, yeah, so just to add to that, there are sort of, as Gemma said, some really interesting um, sort of cross-national and I suppose cross-generational things that can be done. Um, we have, by we, Gemma, Rebecca and myself with other colleagues have been discussing as well the idea of doing some sort of cross-generational um, work going back further to try and see how you can account for changing sort of policy, legal um, and other sort of social and other sort of um, things in relation to this. But as but data again becomes one of the issues because lots of older cohorts, although they exist, did not ask questions around sexual and gender identity. So it's hard to go back very far because these type of data have only been really collected in the last couple of decades. Oh, we have another question. Um, from Kate Gallen. Um, Rebecca, this is questions for Rebecca. You made a comment about the masculine body ideal of the Muslim man moving from straight culture into the gay, into gay culture. My experience was that this body ideal exploded in gay culture during the AIDS crisis. Um, and then this then permeated into straight spaces. In many ways, LGBTQ spaces and people lead aspects of straight cultures in the process of commodification. I was just wondering if your research does account for cross-pollination in this way. Yeah, so that's really interesting. I think because we recruited young people, sometimes they, I think there was this um, acknowledgement of the history of struggles that LGBT people have gone through, but it was very much their account of how they experienced gay culture and spaces they felt comfortable in and experimenting with that and realising that wasn't for them. Um, I'm not sure about that that particular piece didn't come out so just being as um true to the data as as it emerged then um that that didn't seem relevant to it necessarily um but i really like your piece about co-modification i think that is happening um and that this binarism between those two cultures is actually not very uh great but it's like how do we um help that unification without suppressing you know our expression um we can have negative impacts both ways probably so that's my answer to that i don't know how how satisfied you will be <laughs> yeah um it, it will be a lot more in depth in the paper so as you can imagine qualitative work uh, it's hard to summarize sometimes Brilliant. Um, thanks, everyone. If people want to stay and ask a few more questions, welcome to. I know there's five more minutes of the session, but I also realize people might want to get on in the afternoon. So thank you really, for, uh, thank you very much for joining. The next Catalyst seminar, I think, is I should know this. It's about calls and methods, but I'm not entirely sure of the date. But if you got this email, you will also get the email about the next one, but also look out for information on Twitter and other places. Um, and yeah, uh, thanks for joining. And as I said, if people want to stay and ask a few more questions, um, and you're also welcome to sort of unmute and unvideo and also ask them and join the chat um, for a few more minutes if you want to. But if not, thank you um, again to our speakers uh, for giving us those really, really thoughtful and um, you know interesting presentations. And thank you everyone for joining. Thanks everyone.